we had six people having up to six people having a psilocybin session in the same room with a therapist each and they were on three doses a placebo dose absolutely nothing sugar pill 10 milligram and 25 milligram and what we were really doing was demonstrating safety as we went into the phase 2b study that we just announced and what we found in this healthy volunteer study is that uh, largely very benign safety uh, perspective about 68 percent of all the things that came up for people disappeared after the psilocybin the next day George Goldsmith, CEO of Compass Pathways, trading on NASDAQ under the symbol CMPS, rejoins us for an update. George, how are you? I'm doing really well. So nice to be with you again. And uh, before we get started, I just want to mention that we are going to make some forward-looking statements in this conversation and uh, refer people to our entry on the SEC website. George, uh, recently you announced that uh, Comp 360 psilocybin study of 89 healthy participants was published in the Journal of Psychopharmacology. Why don't you give us an overview of the significance of that and what it means for the shareholders in Compass Pathways? Sure. Actually, because of the nature of publication, this study was done uh, almost two years ago. Um, it was, but however, it's now published in a very reputable peer-reviewed journal. Um, we sort of, this is what's called a phase one study. It was with healthy volunteers. Um, and as you know, despite all the hype about psilocybin and so forth, there are very few actually large randomized controlled trials. Uh, this one at the time it was conducted was the absolute largest ever done in 60 years. Um, and that trial really was looking at, are there any kind of cognitive or emotional challenges that can come up through taking psilocybin. It's really about safety. Um, and you start that in all clinical development with healthy volunteers, then you move to patients. But we knew that the results would probably be fairly benign as they proved to be. Um, but we did also want to explore some other things because as we move forward in the real world, um, I think we have to really look at the model of delivery because the problems are so huge. Sadly, so many people are depressed. Uh, so many people struggle. And uh, even just in the area of so-called treatment-resistant depression, these people are very ill, two to four failures of prior medicines, often struggling with depression for years. Even though that's so severe, there are all tens and tens of millions, almost 100 million of those worldwide. So the first question is, how do you serve those? Let's assume that uh, actually psilocybin therapy does meet the safety and efficacy needs of regulators and our product is of the highest quality. Well, then what? And so this study was really designed to look at how we could experiment with different models of delivery. Uh, historically in the 60s and even in some of the studies over the last 10 years, the traditional model is to have two psychotherapists and a single patient. And we felt that that was perhaps certainly nothing that could work to scale to the problem. So the first thing we did in this study was look, could we do one-to-one -one support and would that be safe for patients? And we can say resoundingly yes. Um, so that's a really important issue as we move into the world of first showing that with healthy volunteers. Recently, we announced a study that was done with the Aquilino Cancer Center in cancer patients. And there we used we used one on one support also. The second thing we tried in this healthy volunteer study was what we refer to as simultaneous administration. So this was done at the UK National Health Service in a clinical research unit. Think of a um, kind of a ward. <laughs> we had six beds, a chair by each side each one. Um, it was lots of LED candles and, you know, we made the room calm and, and quite peaceful. But we had six people having, up to six people, having a psilocybin session in the same room with a therapist each. And they were on three doses, a placebo dose, absolutely nothing, sugar pill, 10 milligram and 25 milligram. And what we were really doing was demonstrating safety as we went into the phase 2B study that we just announced. And what we found in this healthy volunteer study is that 
uh, largely very benign safety uh, perspective, about 68% of all the things that came up for people disappeared after the psilocybin the next day. Um, and the most common thing was headache. So, so I think this, is, this was kind of what we expected and we confirmed. But the really interesting thing is there were really no issues other than some reduced anxiety on the part of people when we did it simultaneously. So that was an interesting finding. And then lastly, we also found that the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, people, there weren't any safety issues that couldn't be addressed, any concerns on the part of patients, even in the high dose conditions. Um, that that needed to be addressed uh, in, a, in a different way. So the model really worked. And it was one therapist per patient and then an overseeing psychiatrist who could, could help. So this, this is really just portending what the future can look like. And that's why it's so important. You know, how do we deal with getting this to the scale it needs to be? And then obviously we take that evidence and we go to regulators and say, this is what happened in healthy volunteers. Can we now look at doing this in patients? And so everything that happens in regulation, I'll shut up finally, is like a stair step, right? So you first do healthy volunteers and you demonstrate, and then you go to the next step, which is the more vulnerable population, patients. Then you demonstrate it there and you progress until you have a body of evidence that says, this works, it's safe, it seems to generate effective response in this kind of patient, and you move on. And that's what the real significance was. It's a new model. And we didn't see any kind of cognitive or emotional deficits or frankly benefits, you know. So, you know, these patients or I'm sorry, healthy volunteers were, you know, very talented, a lot of students and so forth. So there wasn't a lot of place for them to improve. Um, so that's what we learned. I have a relationship with a young individual who is, uh, you know, struggling to somewhat. And uh, so the requirement for um, psilocybin treatment in the mental health realm is, is self-evident to me. That's how we started, actually, with a family issue. And it's all too prevalent. Everyone has a story. Right. Right. Well, and it's interesting in my case because the individual in question is uh, has some experience recreationally uh, with with psychedelics, psilocybin in particular, and uh, so when I suggested that you know a, a way forward might be to explore some psychedelic uh, research as a as a study participant, he said, you know, no, no, I've been down that road, and I said, yeah, but you. You know, you're doing mega doses to achieve a hallucinogenic effect, and you're not taking a therapeutic approach with a measured dose in a clinical environment that's got a therapist present to guide your thinking and your emotional sort of reaction to this. So, anyways, got them halfway talked into it, I like to think, and so it'll be interesting to see. But I'm curious as to how, how widespread is the knowledge among mental health professionals uh, worldwide at this point of the of the efficacy that is being demonstrated in trials like yours uh, of the ability of psilocybin to treat met certain mental illness issues like depression. So it's a great question of do people really know about the promise of psychedelic therapy for depression. I think we have to be really kind of cautious at this point. Uh, we've just done the largest study that has ever been done in, in psychedelics and psilocybin specifically with depression. 233 patients, 22 sites, 10 countries, seven different languages, all different therapists trained and so forth. And what we found was remarkable and cautionary. The remarkable bit was after a single dose, no one was on any antidepressants, everyone came off antidepressants, very controlled fashion. And after a single psychedelic experience with COMP360 psilocybin therapy, um, which was a couple preparation sessions, a session of having the psilocybin in a very quiet, calm environment, and some follow-up. What we found was 25% of patients, a remarkable number were in remission at the end of the 12 weeks. Um, this is something that's never been seen before, a single dose leading to that type of response. Now, here's the issue. 75% didn't have that response. 
And so this fits very well with the study that was done at Imperial College in London in 2016, where they also had about the same number of people who were sustained responders at 12 weeks. But this is remarkable in this area, very difficult to treat depression, people who are suffering for a long time. So we're just scratching the surface of why would someone not respond? Why would somebody respond? And until we get deeper into that answer, I think we need to really be cautious because it isn't a panacea. It shouldn't be put in the water supply. And, and I think this is a really big, a big issue for all of us of how do we tamper, tamp down a little bit of the expectation and really follow the science and do large trials. And that's where we're headed next is to do a very large what's called phase three trial. And we're in discussion with regulators about that for later in the year. Right. Interesting. I, uh, you know, I, I had a, a very long career with, uh, with, with psilocybin and the recreational side, which, which I came to believe was so effective in answering so many internal questions that I, I like to think of myself of having morphed from a recreational mindset to more of a sort of self-discovery mindset and where I was observing myself. And that was one of the great things about psilocybin is it gave me the ability to project my perception from a third party perspective and made me see the ridiculousness of, of you know, clinging to thoughts that were you know, negative and that were very much of my own construction and only existed because of my own support. So I, I was uh, really interested to find that you know, I had to experiment with different dosages. So my lead up to that is, is, is in questioning the lack of a response from the 75% group, I mean, fantastic that a single dose is gonna put people in a remissive state after one dose, but it's entirely acceptable in my view and hopefully in the clinical community's view that some people might need a little bit more, not necessarily heavier dosage, but maybe more of a tailored dose or a repeated dose to loosen up certain metaphysical frameworks in the mind. Well, I think, first of all, you're so blessed in a way, James, because you don't suffer from treatment-resistant depression, right? And so psychedelics are referred to as mind manifesting. And if you're really in a desperate state where nothing has worked for you, and you encounter one of these trials and you think this is going to be the cure, you have high expectations. And people going into the trial, if it's mind manifesting and all they can see is despair and hopelessness, that's what can manifest. So it's quite different experience for people who are suffering from severe mental illness than someone who is healthy trying to, I like to say, recreate. <laughs> so a recreational experience, you're trying to recreate something about your life as a healthy person. Right. And so I think it's a really important cautionary tale in a way. Now, the reason we did only one dose is super simple. Compass, our, our, our true north of Compass is evidence, evidence, evidence. And what we found is that there were no studies before that really looked at how long would a single dose last. Um, and until we know that, then we can't figure out who needs a second dose? How might that work? Uh, do you give people who don't have a response a, a second dose, or do you only use that to maintain the people who did respond? Um, and so what's beautiful, too, about this work is that when you provide psilocybin, unlike almost any other medicine, at least any other medicine I'm familiar with in depression, you know the day after whether someone's going to respond. If they don't respond on day two, they're not going to respond on week one. Right. And it's remarkable. So that gives us the ability to think about, well, how do we handle those folks? Because with a traditional antidepressant, it's usually 12 weeks before whether you know if the first dose or an increased dose will work for you. So this just is a paradigm shift and really remarkable promise for patients. But we have to follow the data. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Definitely the, uh, the next day should be a, <laughs> a new day in more ways than one, at least from my experience. And, and good point about, uh, you know, obviously not having the basis of a, uh, 
you know, uh, clinical resistant depression or treatment resistant depression. I mean, yes, I've, I've always been fortunate enough to come at it with a more or less uh, optimistic and, uh, and happy <laughs> place. So, but I, again, I think that that is because I was fortunate enough to be exposed to psychedelics uh, from a very young age and, and uh, you know, I really credit psychedelic experience with the ability of uh, at least the elasticity in my perception to like my first reaction to adverse circumstances mentally is not fear, it's not dread, it's not hopelessness or despair, it's always hopeful curiosity and interest and willingness to face it straight on because Exposure to psilocybin, especially in large doses, brings you face to face with these mental images, which are originated in the mind, that you nonetheless are forced to, you can't run, you can't flee from them. So they, they cause you to, like at the end of the, the trip, you realize that, wow, that was some scary stuff, but, uh, but I could, you know, whatever you manifest is what you manifested. I talked to it, I laughed with it, we danced together, whatever it is. But uh, so anyways, I, and I, I do want to, I don't want to convey to the audience that it's uh, recommendable in any way, shape or form to go off experimenting on psychedelics on your own if you're not, if you're not predisposed to do so and have a history of doing so. So I think that, uh, you know, t to me it's just, I wish that the world would move a little faster and that you know, I think in high schools, there should be a, an availability, a pathway, a compass pathway to, for students who are struggling internally to say, hey, if you're struggling internally with depression or you think you might be depressed or you're having thoughts of, you know, self-destructive thoughts, uh, here's, a, here's a route for you to go and explore and a program for you to go into. And I just think that that would be so beneficial to so many kids at that vulnerable age where, you know, I mean, teen suicide is, is, is its own category. And, and James, I think that this is part of the long-term vision, but we also, long-term vision in terms of, you know, there are so many adolescents who are suffering. Um, and so, you know, part of what each regulator asks is how do we help that group? And so we're looking very carefully at the safety, how we might work with that group as part of a, what the FDA refers to as a pediatric plan. Now, remember everything that we're doing is on the, in the lane of working to transform mental health um, at scale for people who are really suffering. We go after the hard stuff. There's a whole other lane that you've talked about, which you know other people have experienced. I've had experience, as I've mentioned in prior things, uh, prior interviews, which have been like yours. But the risk for people who are really suffering is is it's dangerous, and the reason we have regulation is simply so that we know who can benefit and who can't, and we're not making claims to vulnerable people. And that's the path that we're on, is to generate that evidence of the highest standard for governments around the world, so people do have access to this powerful tool first to really help with serious mental illness. And, and the question is, when do you stop making someone better? George, uh, we're gonna have to leave it there for now. I really enjoy our conversations and I can't wait for the next one. Congratulations on all your success and I hope you the best in the future. Thanks for your time today. You bet, James. Thanks so much. Love watching the fish tank. <laughs> you bet. Bye for now. <laughs>